Welcome to Tukey Sidebar, a book club for Gnostic Anons. I'm David. I'm Gabe, also known as The Fool. And I'm Capitalissimo, and I've been supping on a steady diet of tree resin and pine needles in order to prepare myself for eternity. And we're back to discuss The Black Album by Matt Pegasus, also known as Matt Pegasus. Uh, this is the first also known as one half of the new right reads. Yeah, also known as one half of the new right, and uh, the guy Gabe uh, met once upon a time in Vegas. Yes, yes. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah, again, ethics in like ethics in gaming right journalism. journalism. <laughs> yes, ethics. Uh, it, full disclosure for not for nepotistic reasons. I did mean Matt Pegasus did meet. We did do dark elf things together. Not gay sex other kind of dark elf things together bass dissonant like cool mold buggy and cool things together his girlfriend was there she was cool everything we did no butthole touching at all between us only (laughs) based esoteric dark elf shit basically you could not have made that sound gayer (laughs) no i'm just i i'm being i'm actually being i'm declaring right because he's had well it's a lady doth protest too much and now i now i wonder (laughs) (laughs) Are no, you guys on the drow low? The drow low. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Normal dark elf stuff. <laughs> the real dark elf heads get this stuff. Um, but yeah, as I said, yeah, this is uh, our, the first of our patron selected reads. So huge thank you to everyone that is backing us on Patreon and Subscribestar uh, who got to vote on a few a few books that we had interest in. And this was this was the lucky winner. And of course, by we mean vote, we of course mean Peter Thiel chose this book. Yes, but all of Peter Thiel's sock puppets <laughs> decided to to vote on this one. And uh, and let's dive into it. And as is our format for anyone that uh, clicked this video, interested in a review, we always start out with a spoiler free generalities section. So we'll kind of let's go over it at a high level, and then we'll do a little bit more of a you know nitty gritty in the details. Not that this is a book that's too messed up by spoilers though because it's um you know half to a quarter or a third essay it's it's a third this fiction it's a third this sort of metafictional autobiographical slurry so it's um it's kind of like an anthology a themed anthology and so you won't get too spoiled even if you listen too long but anyway we'll stick to our format Let's do a quick, um, we'll go around, go around the table as it were, and just do high level generalities on, uh, the blacked album. Black oh, album. I, as a disclaimer, I do not support that naming. <laughs> Even my Gen S denounces is it, that name. Is it the blackest coal or is it a pressed <laughs> gem, Gabe? Or no, it'll be, listen, it is, we can do like, oh yeah, like, esot- like exoterically it's coal, but Ex- esoterically it's a gem you have to out- use alchemy you have to use alchemy to make the coal oh, into a so gem good right exactly <laughs> that'll, that'll be the that'll be the thumbnail like a like a like a like a wojack but he's like an alchemist he's turning a piece of coal into a gem <laughs> you, got, you got alchemized a coal into a gem that's it it's a, a trans a transmutation right it's a trans gem oh god <laughs> Do the do the meme of the guy squatting about to shit out a video game, and he's like, "Don't shit it out." He's like, "Hey, I'm still transmuting. You don't even know what it is yet." <laughs> the other meme, I have two meme templates because I think in memes. The other one is just like all three of us in the corner saying, "Oh, this is so esoteric. No one knows how esoteric I am right now at this party." The, uh, the my feet hurt meme. Didn't we already do that one as a thumbnail? I guess we did already. I don't do think that we one. have. Probably. No, we so it's up for grabs. It's, liter- it's literally oh. us reading dissident right fiction. <laughs> no one else. No one else has read any of this. Yeah, no, nobody else read. Uh, Shut up! We're reading uh, Dad Brown. Incel. <laughs> but what? But what is? Um, I, I guess I can just start with mine then. Um, in terms of at a high level. Physically, book is a book. I do not have a physical copy for the record. I went with digital. Um, I even got I even got totally cucked by Amazon because they like upgraded their security or some shit, so I couldn't even steal it. So I had to beg for a copy after I bought it from Matt. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> Wait, you had to. <laughs> so, what, what do you mean? See, I have a Kobo, oh, so you I have to break. get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I have to switch it over to a different format, and they they came up with 
since the last time I did it, which was a while ago, I think for Nutcranker, actually, funny enough. Um, so, yeah. It, but long story short, I just could not transfer, and I just blew blew some money for no reason. But, well, for to Matt, a worthy cause. You can no longer get the book um, through esoteric means. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I can't speak to the physical stuff, and um, I may have formatting things that aren't in the final uh, copy. Judging the uh, Judging the book by its cover... Um, it is a very clean look. Uh, it's got two sigils. It's got the eight-pointed chaos star uh, and the star of David. Um, the spine is it's and the it is entirely black. The spine has um, what I believe to be the Amazon KDP default font. Uh, it says the Black Album and uh, Matt Pegas on the end. Don't use the default font, kids. Just don't don't use the default font anymore. <laughs> oh, I, I thought the font was a Straussian reference to a Bronze Age pervert, actually, because BAP also has the same font, I believe, in Bronze Age hmm. mindset. Well, default on, font. On its spine. <laughs> the, <laughs> the the choice of winners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> too I'm too busy to uh, to yes. mess around with uh, with serif fonts. And but and, and real quick, I want to ask Cap: Is your star David slightly like glow in a dark blue? Because I feel like my Star of David is like a slightly yeah, different... glowy like Star of David? Uh, well, not I'm good, not so. sure if it's merely the power of suggestion or the power of chaos magic. But um, I, uh, I I kind of see that it is a little grayed out. Um, I, yeah, it's a different color than the, star, than the, than the yeah, chaos it is, symbol. Yeah, it is subtly different. Um, uh, very, very subtle. Yeah, in fact, I had not noticed it until you pointed it out, but you are absolutely correct. It does not glow in the dark, though, for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's just a subtle, it's like a subtle different coloration. Yeah. Like, it, I, I was, like, tricking myself. I was wondering if it was real or not. I know you, you had were not copies, psyoping so yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I was committing chaos magic upon myself as a dark yeah. elf. In terms of the content of it, though, I would say I am probably the well outside the target demographic well i'm both i am with m the target demographic as one of the um you know the the micro niche of the micro niche of people that that read this stuff but i'm also i i have an allergy to the words esoteric gnostic and mystic which i think appear i think on every page of <laughs> or every other page of this book and the the topics they cover kind of you know aspire to you know relate to them I, I just but just to say that's not my cup of tea personally but i i did overall enjoy the read i thought there was a lot of quality there in terms of at the sentence level at the writing level i had some i had some issues structurally with it um with some of the things that were chosen to be in it as content some of the the ways it was kind of a little bit of the book as a as a concept of the way it's laid out um but in terms of on a, a line by line and a sort of a uh, story by story, well, a lot of his essays too. Um, I largely quite enjoyed it, um, even though I guess I had some reservations structurally. Cap, uh, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I get the, I get the, I get the side A, side B. He has, he has this little this what he calls his interlude. I, I think that his metafictional stuff combined with sort of the um, ideological is probably not the correct word, but the conceptual underpinnings, I would say, of the of the metafiction, which is which is his essays uh, or seems to be. I think it would have actually worked better um, if the if the fiction sections were, you know, sort of woven in between the essays. And I, yeah. you know, I get if you want to refer back to an essay um, for what for you know whatever reason it's it's a little cleaner to organize it in this way, but um, I, I think that I think that it would have had more impact if you know it wasn't you read the first third of the book or so uh, and you get this this narrative and then you have these you know, these older essays of his used to explain the concepts that were, that were in the fiction. Mm -hmm. Like I, that's, it was not, 
I would have. I think I would have enjoyed it more if I had, if this had been rearranged. And at least for me, more fiction, um, like cutting out maybe some of those older essays and filling out some more of that fiction or a different story, maybe. But I, I thought that was the, one of the stronger parts. Um, well, for me, I ended up first. I ended up hating the first uh, story. Or we'll get into that. For um, oh, I, I applied what is called you all heard of the Bechdel test. Why well, I, I applied the Soyjack test <laughs> yeah. to the uh, to the first story. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get into that when we get to that. But um, I ended up as the more I read, the more I chewed on it, and the more depth it had. And I basically kind of figured out what he was going for right around during a particular section. And of course, right when I when I read the because he structured like an album, but the essay section is called the B sides, and that's where he keeps the essays. And the essays, I kind of love the relationship between the essays and the fiction, uh, because it kind of blend together in a kind of beautiful praxis of art. Like both the you got the theory cell shit, and you got the performance of the theory in the fiction, which I, I really 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 loved. Actually, I thought it was very almost Wallace esque because I when I first saw him being a fictionalized character in his own work, I'm like, oh, this is like Wallace is like good old neon. This is like a pale thought, not pale fire, pale pale king. And um, so as I I actually the more and more I read, the more and more I enjoyed it. So I quite love the structure. So by the end of it, man, I was just eating frosting at that point by the essays. I think he's like really good essayist. I, I did enjoy some sections of the of the metafiction. I like this sort of um, seduction to the left hand path. This you know, this idea that this uh, this Y character is is clearly unhinged uh, in uh, exoteric ways, but maybe a genius in esoteric ways. Um, like all of that is all of that is very interesting and compelling, and then, you know, the dramatic irony of seeing, of seeing the the the, the many deaths of of Matt Pegas, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, but but seeing him continue his conversations with, uh, with Y. Uh, thereafter, it's it was uh that that was that was the most satisfying part for me personally and i feel like if if matt was trying to inject himself into the fiction and create this um this this eminem's stan uh mm -hmm. kind of kind of character then you know maybe maybe having um you know, maybe having the fictional sections, which are referring to th to concepts that he's that he later discusses in his essays, in fact, follow the essays individually one after another, would have been a a more interesting and effective way uh, to tell the story. I think I would have enjoyed that more. And I was mm -hmm. I was thinking that as I was you know when I got to the essay section, I was just like, oh well, I I, I see now. <laughs> I thought it was going to revert back. Actually, that's what I was. I was, like, I was, buckled I was in hoping. For. Yeah, I was hoping that we would see more come back in, uh, and and there was none. That would you know you mm -hmm. blow your you blow your fictional load at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's sex magic. Sex <laughs> magic, by the way. So you you should have Matt well, Matt. You yeah. should have retained. You should have retained your precious fluids, <laughs> and and released them at a more opportune <laughs> time, and then it would have mm. been more impactful listen you should have listened to that nofap guy at the presbyterian church dude you <laughs> but uh I, I it's interesting that you and i both came in oh it's revealed now at the essays but you took it as a negative you'd rather have it be front loaded with that revelation well i i, I think they should have been Matt i think they should have been with that co more cohesively presented rather than one uh -huh. one is the fiction side one is the non-fiction side I think it would have been more, more effective if the fiction and the nonfiction were a sort of call and response because they are, they are actually a call and response in terms of content, right? Yeah, like the the, the first essay is a skeleton key to the fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Fuck. <laughs> 
that's kind of our. I mean, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the that's. Like, I don't no, want it to be the whole thing. But that's kind of the right whole now. thing. We did yeah, it in fifteen of, minutes. Well, <laughs> listen, we, we, it's it's very hard to talk about this book because in order to talk about it with any sense of depth or to counter each other's points, we would have to go super in detail. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the the book is very much a meta piece. The entire piece is a meta piece. Right, so you can't really nitpick any of this or one thing because it, it's, no, it's not short stories, by the way. I feel like these are basically like twin chapters of a narrative whole, basically. So it's hard to reference something without going in Aspergery detail until we get there. Okay, well, let's, let's dive into it, but we can, we can do it like into Aspergery. <clears throat> we can kind of follow. There's a couple key... There's a few threads. I don't know, columns, yeah. There's like vertical slices that come up again and again. There's... There, there's a stand called there's the stand and then even stan has like a little sub story where it's like a um it's like about the tibetan um chant that they discover which i don't even think that was from pegasus point of view wasn't that from a different person's point of view no that's a no, that's so there's there's it's bifurcated to, to fiction is two stories you got the stan arc yeah. and you kind of got you got there's a quote-unquote z and there's matthew pegasus there's two pegasus in this mm-hmm. story all right, you got you got Matthew Pegasus, the guy who sits with a Glock in his hand and across the room with uh, Matthew, or not Matthew. What's his name? I forgot the guy who, who did the shooting, like the base oh, boomer who did the shooting oh, in Mandalay Bay. Um, Gridlock is, is the guy who got comped. I, 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 uh, I don't remember his name either, but yeah, I know you yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so there's the there's a the guy who there who spirit who achieves kind of a pseudo spiritual line. Who where a lot of the a lot of the autobiography comes from that Matthew Pegasus. Mm-hmm. That a lot of the autobiography is relationship with his father, the Boy Scouts, Stephen his relationship Paddock. with masculinity and violence. Stephen Paddock, thank you. Um, and uh, so he, uh, there's that Matthew Pegasus, and there's the Pegasus of Z, and they have two different endings. There's there's two alternate versions of Matthew Pegasus. An interesting subtitle: the Black Album, you know, semicolon, the the strange deaths of Matthew Pegasus. Because uh, cause the um, entity known as Matthew Pegasus dies twice in this novel. Both Stan and um, the Matthew Pegasus arc, quote-unquote, both end in a lotus position Buddha Vista death. Bodhisattva. In a, in a different enlightenment. You got Bodhisattva. Thank you. Uh, uh, the brown person corrected my pronunciation. Thank you. Sir, um, sir, you're mispronouncing. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sir, please stop. Do not redeem. <laughs> Listen, the, uh, this, I have you know the Aryan white boys invented Hinduism first. Thank you very much. I think Tibetan Bronze Age a- an, um, analysis has proven this, by the way. So, um, but yeah, so both of them end in a death, in a positive Schopenhauerian a death, and a negative life denying uh, form of death, which we will, yeah, again, we have to get to later. First, we have to we have to study the woe jackery of the Stan arc first. Mm. Um, and then what are the other major categories? Well, I guess there's the essays and the essays. I don't even know if I'd break them into, I mean, there's just, there's a few different essays. Um, there's, there's two kinds of essay. One is sort of a, um, Gonzo, my, my field trip to, to Vegas and, and the others are more theory cell. Right. The Vegas one is like just autobiography, I think. Yeah. And, the, and I, to those ones, I was confused. I was like, is this how fictionalized should I take this as? I'm not saying that's a negative thing that I was uncertain, but I, yeah, I wasn't totally sure how to take that, especially with him, Pegasus being a reference as, uh, as the character earlier on. Um, Gabe, do you want to just hit us with your with your Stan theory and, and All right, yeah, the Stan the, analysis? The, 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 the Stan analysis. Yes, defer the Stan cell <laughs> analysis. Yes. Ahem. All right. So the beginning story is an email train between the recipient. Actually, which is, first, uh, for the record, this Z. is our very first epistolary piece, Gabe. So this is this is in we fact epistolary. It. <laughs> it is it is a this real is deal epistolary. It's not it's not like like oh, no. what you constantly ascribe epis, epistolary uh, stories oh, to. I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is Neo Pistol. Oh my this god, Neo. die. Jesus <laughs> Christ, game. Just take the take the W, bro. <laughs> this is okay, it starts off as a Neo epistolary I'm Todd um, Howard. N- n- segment. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, don't you already broke my copy of Fallout 3. I don't need to be have my Fallout New Vegas copy broken as well. But uh 
Anyway, so it starts off as a neo-epistolary narrative between the recipient of an email, which is named Z. Z is Matthew Pegasus, and the sender of the email, known as Y. We never know Y's real name. And it, basically, Y is an old friend slash colleague of Matthew Pegasus' old days as a blogger, alt of center. There's even a screenshot of his old Twitter uh, hyping up alt of center back in the old glory days of the of uh, 2016-2014 era of like fast wave and like meme culture, meme magic, keck, praise keck, all the esoteric, or the or glory days of internet culture for us. You know, my genesis, my birth, basically, of the gloriness of the internet. Um, Kekistan. So it's a bit, bit of a nostalgia trip. Ke- yes, Kekistan. Chatelet, man. You weren't there, man. You weren't there for the flag. You weren't there for for Richard Spencer posing next to a, an anime frog. You just weren't there. You weren't there. But anyway, so Matthew Pegasus is having a, a discussion with Y, who and Y is a true cell. He's stone cold. He doesn't have a girlfriend. He's totally committed to destruction of everything that and exists. Homo nationalism. And, well, that, well, Matthew implies homo nationalism, really. I mean, y just kind of flirts with it, while Z in, like kind of forces no, no, on no. it. Z, Z is and, uh, Z is Pegasus, and Y Y is Stan. yeah, Z is Pegasus. No, he he literally says, "I think we should be together." It's like almost word for word, the Stan, yeah. the the line from Stan. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but that's not that's no. He wants to die in the mulch with him, or he wants to turn him into like a bullet vista, right? I, uh, so I'm it's not, not necessarily sexual. You again. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to maintain the. If flow you reach enlightenment right? and you decide to flow. stay in the phenomenal world, you're you're a buena vista. <laughs> <laughs> this is your Mexican coming out, Gabe. <laughs> oh fuck you! This is my conquistador coming out. Thank you very much, the conquista. Um. So they have this discussion, and if I, I actually kind of got furious. I got angry during this because I kind of was like, "What the fuck is this shit?" Because I, I didn't make the stand metaphor in my head. Um, uh, because for some reason, because I knew, because I listened to his interview of Hoffmeister, a great interview, and uh, he was talking about. So Z is is Pegasus, and the thing is, Pegasus comes off as like a normie in this in this dialogue chain. Like, why is actually like blatantly correct. Like, one person is clearly cringe, and the other one's blatantly based. But the clearly cringe one is the voice, it's a narrative. If it's the, the narrative is taking the side of Z, even though obviously Z, Y, is the one who's correct. Right? Because he even says, you know, listen, I am the, I, I have talked to the angels. I am the next, I am the, I am bringing the Nietzschean will to life. I am the, I am Schopenhauer. While you're in the graveyard making tasteful pictures of your beautiful girlfriend, I actually am revolting against the modern world, dude. And Z basically tells While him, like, you had um, premarital like, sex, I was studying <laughs> the blade. The blade. Yeah. Yes, I was studying the order of the I, nine. I just angels. want to point yes. out that I can always count on you, Gabe, to take the side of the insane <laughs> stalker, uh, who who is narratively uh, narratively positioned to be a fucking lunatic, yeah. a, a obsessed <laughs> sodomite that just is like hunting down. Yes, our poor protagonist here. I almost, I almost want I, like, mean, <laughs> I want, I want you to watch Saltburn and then tell me who who you think is in the right. <laughs> Oh, that's the new movie, right? It's the, like it's the other version. one that's not gay enough, <laughs> according to Saint Norm. <laughs> okay, but no. But think about it. I like characters that stick by their virtues. I like the Don Quixotes. I like the underground men. I like men who believe in their virtues, who enact out their will upon the world. And Whether like, that's this, homo nationalism or... <laughs> Yes, yeah, okay. I'm just the Chad. Yes to that, and, and this and this is this is y'all heard of the Bechdel test. This is the soy okay. jack test. I'll mm-hmm. go say a statement, and you're gonna say a mentally picture the beautiful dolls, the Wojak dolls, the Giga Chad doll, and the soy jack doll. And I want you to place rich this. I'm gonna say this paragraph, and I want you to know place this paragraph in the mouths of the Giga Chad, or does it belong in the mouth of the soy jack? <clears throat> I have no idea what you're talking about, and I am blocking you everywhere right now. If you ever attempt to reach out to me again, I will get a restraining order. If that doesn't scare you as much as it ought to, I'll post everything I know about you online, warning people that you're insane and dangerous person. Get off the computer and please get help. Why? Do it immediately. I don't know. 
This I guess that's a giga chat. chat. Obviously, Andrew from the 2023 Masterpiece Incel. I recognize that performance anywhere. <laughs> yes, and it's clearly Andrew. Or they both belong in like the collective unconscious archetype of the soy jack. This is a soy jack statement. This is not the giga chat. I am the reincarnation of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, and I will destroy everything that exists. Yeah. I have been listening to the angels. I am the reincarnation. I am growing my own burial plot in my closet right now. Yeah. While you're making this tasteful was, this pictures was revealed, with your girlfriend this was in the graveyard. To me in, a, in a dream. Yes. Yes. Right. So, so as I'm about to hit the drywall of my knuckles upon reading this in furious anger, I stop because my Straussian senses are tingling. Right. Because. I know, because this is actually probably the most st- objectively Straussian work we've ever covered, or at least anything that's exoterically Straussian. All, be, all our works are Straussian to a certain degree. Because uh, I realized there's a contradiction. Matt knows, because he's in the... He, Matt knows that people... This work is for people in the know. It's people. It's part of the esoteric vanguard. It's for the brotherhood. It's for the lodge. This is the work of the lodge. So he knows that I know that everyone else knows that Z is in the wrong and Y isn't correct. He's based. He's blatantly based. Oh, my gosh. Well, well Y is being... It's happening again. It's happen- it happens every time. <laughs> yeah. Why am I still surprised? <laughs> why why no, did I think we would it, get past this? This He confirms it later. I, I felt... I listen. You know the the Wojak who's like whose brain is so big because he's yeah, enlightened. He's, flo- he's intellect. floating around. On yes, it, yeah. it's euphoric. <laughs> it's euphoric, right? Because he basically confirms this with the monsters of the will. Why is a monster of the will here? He takes the negative path of destruction of the world around. Only the only thing that can save the world is by destruction by alchemizing the negative part of the will. Right, the, the destruction of everything that exists as as a Bapian view of the Buddha. Yeah, and uh. It cultivates with a person it dying. And this person who dies at the end of this conversation is in a lotus position with a green apple upon his chest who died of a heart attack with a smile upon his face in the symbol of the Buddha Hista. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, yeah, Hista, right? Bo- uh, whatever. Buddha Hista. Bodhisattva. Um, uh, <laughs> Bodhisattva. Bodhis- Bo- Bo- Brodhisattva. Bro. Brodhisattva. <laughs> The Brody Safa, the, 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 whatever. Anyway, so this is the cultivation of the Stan arc at this point. Now, this is the Pulp Fiction style structure where the Stan arc uh, tops, it's like a horseshoe, it hops in the middle and it goes back in the end. It wraps around at the end of the fiction uh, section. So after we have our Stan arc where it is announced at the end of it that, you know, Y is too based for Z and Z blocks him. Uh, it is revealed out of out of dialogue that a character has died and has achieved a sort of weird enlightenment. Yeah. Simple, not, not a full enlightenment, by the way, because of the green apple he's holding upon his chest. Green apples are not fully ripe. They're only like partially ripe. And they're not fully ripe. I should have beef uh, with this, just, by the way. I'm sorry to interrupt your Straussian reading, but just like from a... Um... I don't know what you call it, a craft perspective. Like I found that switch from epistolary to third omniscient, just telling you, oh, by the way, this this is exactly what happened later. I found that pretty jarring. And it was like, I was like, uh, to be honest, I actually thought that was kind of a rough start. Cause I was like, uh, I don't know. Like, to me, like it, it, it wasn't staying within the frame it had established. And I also, I think it would have been more impactful. Kind of the earlier point we said about having the fiction go on later to not give this away to this level yet. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just, I, I just felt like it sapped some of the, the climax from it. Well, <laughs> we'll get to that yet again, the climax, there's multiple climax. I climax multiple times during this reading. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. You guys got to learn to All retain. Right. I, I, you guys got to re- learn, learn to retain. <laughs> Listen, Pegasus is a fellow accidental aristocrat. He's a based homeschool Nietzschean, just like me. So we're just in the same wavelength. Mm. You see, you're you're yeast life. You're part of the last men. You just don't get it. Yeah, oh strange God. waves. Oh, me and him, we just. I, I had one more question about your reading of that, though, because later on, uh, Pegasus describes himself as an establishmentarian, and and in the essay portion, this is like late B side coverage. Um, like I'm just curious how you square that circle where he's saying that as sort of, this is one of his more final essays. It's the last, it's is, the last essay that's on Strauss, funny yeah. enough. It's the and last then, essay. How do you 
merge that with your view that he is he is saying that the 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 Pegasus stand in here is incorrect. Well, because yet again, remember there's two Matthew Pegasus within this narrative arc, and uh, I'll explain this dualistic view of that he has right because he has a dualistic view of Nietzsche and a dualistic view of Schopenhauer, a fundamentally pessimistic world. As like basically doesn't matter versus the affirmation that everything that exists is will. It's about forming. It's alchemizing the will. You just alchemize the will and bring it forth into creation, right? The, the Chad yes of affirmation. Yes, there is no meaning. Let's create our own meaning of Nietzsche and Bap versus the negative uh, Schopenhauerian, which is total nihilism of Ligotti, Thomas Ligotti, and pseudo Lovecraft. And uh, we actually, I can reveal this coming soon because after, so the the Stan arc of the fictions ends with that temporarily, and we're introduced to a new Matt Pegasus, the Matthew Pegasus of the auto fictional bent, and um, is the it, this starts off as him just celebrating Christmas by himself. Um, he had just eaten a bad fish. His his tummy hurts. He thinks about calling his parents. And he hasn't talked to his parents in a long time. He's right now in Vegas. And he, he's in the hallway right across where Stephen Braddock did his deed. And um, he discusses... And the thing is, he has an obsession. In this universe, he is actually like a true crime podcaster. Right? One of the few male ones around. And he, he discusses the... the mystique of Stephen Braddock about how he is the son of a literal western style bandit bank robber and uh, he, he does a contrast of like there's a he subtly says that he basically dabbed on the posers basically because he talks about you know this son of the west this gambler who who gambled that night and slept all day with, with bank robber blood in his jeans this man of the western archetype of the bandit is, is shooting down on the poser pop country fans below him right he he doesn't say that outright but he basically refers with the use of the word pop country he basically says basically that he was dabbing on the posers basically it was the ultimate when I say total girl in a t-shirt death. You know he put into action. Yeah, this is this is the the Darth Pegasus trip to Vegas, which will be discussed later with the what's the Jedi term? The Jedi Pegasus visit, right? <laughs> Enlightened. Yes, yes, yes the, the positive, the green apple versus the base Buddha blade. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. So he reflects upon his life and have himself growing up, and he you know. He reflects upon his relationship with his father and uh, well, male violence because he reflects on writing Dragon Day. And, and Cap can give more context. He actually r wrote Dragon Day. My only reference to Dragon Day is ARX Han's review and this oh, book. So it's actually you, very you interesting have, how, how not, our have either of you guys contrast. read Dragon Day? Nope. Uh, uh, I will also do the Norm MacDonald review on Dragon Day. Not gay enough. It was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dragon Day's actually Dragon hey, Day's actually it? good. Uh it is unfairly slept on. Um and I I was yeah, honestly I was hoping for for more for a more refined fi fiction voice uh in um in the Black Album and it is not there. Uh you just wanted more gay rape. I, I I did definitely get my fill <laughs> of it in uh <laughs> <laughs> in Dragon Day, it's more than enough. Well, well, speaking of gay rape, he talks about male bonding and how male bond through violence, because he reflects upon his times and the Boy Scouts, right? Because he talks about how he he was homeschooled and about how communicating via digital and like he would go out with his friend, who I forget his name. Do -do -do, was what is his name? Uh, I can't remember. Fuck me, I can't remember. The Boy Scout uh, friend friend's name. when he was little. But, Yes, the the Boy Scout friend who is like a rocker who gets him into like actually good music in mosh pits. Yeah, I don't recall he, either. Because he compares himself to Brett Easton Ellis, and not, but like it's not even it's not Brett Easton Ellis was much more socially aware or like more like oh this is what the kids are doing. He's he's in a dialogue with everyone around him. While as this book or or what Dragon Day was supposed to be it was a specific look into the headspace of like a certain man uh -huh. who was born in like a millennial in the twenty tens. Basically, the incel, the outsider, basically, which is basically right before 2010s was right when the the nomian, the nomian worldview of the society around us said no to the incel. The 2010s was right when the internet, the white man's internet, was closed to us, and we had to bunker down in our ghettos. Right? We didn't want to look in the Travis Bickles of the world. We didn't want to look at the disenfranchised man. We silenced him. 
right? So that was the twenty tenth was right when that conceptually actually had a bit of a beef with that with this chapter. Well, again, at a line by line uh, level, I thought it was good and all, but conceptually, this claim because to some extent, yes, there has been ghettoization on the internet, but in terms of like incel support or I don't know popular. Uh, I don't know what the word for it, appeal. I mean, that's never been something that society has endorsed any way. It's always just been barely tolerated. And his claims about male violence being like the most formative thing has just not been my... Granted, you know, some have accused me of being a twink, but it's never been my experience with male friendship has been this violent base. I, I found it a little bit um, LARPy, that perspective. And maybe there are people that view male friendship more in that way and they define it but it that didn't ring and i wasn't sure how sincere he was about it either because of the framing of the book I'm like is this a positive claim being made here in the fiction does that make sense oh, i thought it was i thought it was like because he he talks about how dragon day was supposed to replicate the feeling of being pummeled in a mosh pit because he says when he's he got a listen he was a lucky son of a bitch as i, like, I got cringe homeschool kids to hang out with he got a hot a christian goth girl to take him to like a good mosh pit with christian like heavy metal like lucky bastard one two he even describes how he first did the mosh pit and how he kind of let himself go he shaved for the first time in his life he got away from this like overthinking of himself and he finally let himself be free for the first time in his life he was free in that moment in that mosh pit well and uh I think that's 100% sincere because, mm. you know, again, the autofiction blends. It's like, you know, it, again, I actually got Walter's vibes from him, which, which he did confirm. I was listening to Art of Darkness podcast with him talking about David Foster Wallace. And all by Art of Darkness, great podcast, a fellow Theo Buck recipient as Friends well the show. As, all, yes. as we are yes. all. Friends of the show. A pull you feel. And, uh, <laughs> a better even, podcast than ours. His if first... you like this, uh, and you, <laughs> oh boy, go, go try them you. and you'll never come back. <laughs> Yeah, there's a reason when Pete pays them the big hey, bucks. They're not, they're so not right. reading Moan, all right? Come back when they cover that. Oh, uh, that's see, that's where we go. That's our guest star when they when they cover Justin Moan. We'll have one of us to have <laughs> Dave come on finally. Um, but yeah, but um, David Foster Wallace is actually the biggest influence on Matt Pegasus, and I and I I, I felt that when he I, my first thought when he saw a fictionalized Matthew Pegasus was oh it's this is like good old neon this is like Oblivion, and um. Or like or the Pale King. So and there's certain aspects, there's certain stylistic influences of, of David Foster Wallace that are in here slightly. Like again, the father scene you reminded me a lot of that father scene in Soul is not a Smithy. Um But you can kind of see this idea of being a super self aware, super chronically it's like destroy like consciously in a panopticon of society, of the of the Nomian authoritarian order peering down upon you. And this, this release, this this deterritorialization of a release of a mosh pit, it deterritorializes. It's the, it is the way of actually being free from the tyranny of thought, the tyranny of logos, which is also an aspect of the essays. And he he frees himself. And he, at the point of being a Boy Scout, he you know he's an atheist. His friend was an atheist. He so therefore the base trad Boy Scouts could not let them go on further. But he misses the Boy Scouts because it was a explicitly male group. And that's something that he desperately wishes and misses in his adult life. The, the Boy Scout was explicitly, exoterically, and esoterically masculine. It was completely for males. And yes, were there shitheads? Yes, but it was a masculine shitheadery. And it was within the potted bounds of people naturally establishing space, the, the Bappian space. Right, contrasting and contracting against other people's senses of domains of spaces and authority and will. It was the classing of wills. And of course, this is the first reference to Pegasus' father. His father, being a, a kind of a lib cuck, a neo lib kind of boomer, is like, you know what? I think having girls in there will do them some good, it will calm them down. And of course, Matthew Pegasus literally says, that's probably the most cringe thing I ever heard out of your mouth, Dad. Mm. Right? And and here's his relationship with his father is quite interesting, and uh, I think in it is not it's the most obviously Wallace esque um, moment in here, and also it, I think it is also one of the it's a pair of keys to unlock the entire narrative. In in my view, hold on, I have the the hold on. Okay, here's a, here's an excellent excerpt. He talks about his father. If y'all if y'all will indulge me, <clears throat> quote. 
I want to ask my dad if he has any advice for me, what I should do with my life. If, in his estimation, it's a radical external change I need, or a radical internal change. Perhaps it is a joyful resignation to fate that I need to embrace. My dad is something of a Nietzschean, like me, so I know this latter notion holds some weight in his thought. I want to talk to my dad about all these things, but not really the kind of things you talk about over the phone, or maybe at all. And uh, I thought that paragraph was great because uh, after reading, this is a book you need to read twice. Well, all books you need to read twice, but especially this book. Uh, it, it does nothing but absolutely reward more detail, more observation, more paying attention, more close reading. This is a book you can only close read, not not like vulgar read in, in the Straussian sense. So this, you notice there's a dichotomy. There's two different ways of living. The exoteric, the radical external change versus the radical internal change, which is a big, big, big pseudo spoiler at this point of the entire narrative part of this uh, story. And you notice this relationship between his father. His father is part of the normy yeast life to be honest with you he's in, he, but he is blessed with certain awareness of this least life but he can never act upon it his the nietzschean will of his father is trapped between his board and like just zoned out eyeballs and he, he every time he's with his family he's kind of just bored out of his mind he, he says this and, he, and the thing is he doesn't resent his father be, being bored out of his mind he, he because he is his father's son he intuitively understands that feeling you know his father wanted more out of life but he is trapped in basically in the age of the last man. He himself only has a spark of that Nietzschean will for more, but it's trapped inside a last man body. And he, Matt, this Matt Pegasus does not want that for himself. Because he looks at he looked up all his friends in the uh in the Boy Scout troop, and they all end up either normies, some drug addicts, one ends up being a tranny. His based rock and roll friend, he doesn't he has no idea where he ended up. Right? So he is rightly terrified of not living out something meaningful, of not achieving anything. It's kind of, yet again, fading away, like being drowned in the yeast of like modern life. And he even mm. talks about growing older. Like, you know, and he's, he has this weird thing of like, you as you grow older, you have to accept yourself in the pecking order. And, you know, you have to realize you have to accept yourself in the pecking order. Like, you know, there's, it is a lot of courage to be a salesman to certain degree. You know, he even says, listen, I can expect to be a promotion. I, I make good money, but I'm still, Actually, I'm what, still fantasizing. It. Perhaps one of the, the saddest flexes I've ever seen in my life, that line, you know, I have, I have an income of over $60,000 a year. So I can afford this hotel room. What's Yikes. the what's the, what's the Dead Baltics little little buddy? Little you got buddy. Your little buddy that you have your little little buddy. No. Ooh. Yeah, the little homies. The little, little homies uh, uh, realize that the hundred k is the hundred k is the new forty k. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and of course he he has nothing but fantasizing about getting a gun from the same getting a gun st- getting a gun from the same gun store that Elliot Rogers went to in Burbank by the way mm-hmm. which is a for a guy actually who fairly makes only sixty k I can understand <laughs> true and uh, the and again the the archetype of the of the bass shooter as a as a archetype of the collective internet uh, unconscious it makes, plays a major role very soon after this. Um, because he eventually he talks more about his magical thinking about and this is where it also blends with his essays because the term we are all chaos magicians in las vegas well, appears both in the fiction part and also in well, the uh, yeah and in, in his in essay, essay section and it's almost the same exact series of bets that he makes and series of very small wins and losses right mm-hmm. it, it, it is almost one to one uh from his essay uh, at the which is like the I don't know penultimate one in the book, um, but it it's it happens at the you know the symmetrically opposite end, <laughs> essentially. Right. Yeah, and like and you know he starts you know, there's a little a nice little touch where you know as he's going out about his day, you know he he has to take a shit and you know after after cracking that particular rat he uh, wipes his he wipes his ass and he finds hemorrhoid blood. And the very same disease that his bro- his father has, he's aging, right? You know, that's where he says the line, you know, decay has its own pull, basically. And uh, and he goes back to his room and starts fantasizing about shooting himself with a, a Glock he bought from the very same gun store that Elliot Roger uh, occupied right across the room from the biggest mass shooting in, the, in American history. And, you know, it's a very... 
he even says something along like he ends up being a Michelle Welbeck character rather than a, a Yukio Mishima character, right? Basically, he, he admits to this, which is another big, big kind of pseudo spoiler for the beginning future fiction, right? Because it's it's a very sad existence. You know, he tried to even get the room of Braddock, but the the cringe Filipino um, guy behind the desk denies him. Yeah. So even if he were to kill himself in Vegas, a it would not get any traction, and b he got the second best room for his purposes, which is the room right across from Braddock's room. Yeah, I love that and, comment uh, about uh, how many people are killing themselves in Vegas every year. But <laughs> then we're just saying that they're so effective at cleaning it up. It's like this hush secret. Um, which I would be surprised yeah, if it's, that's it's, true. Yeah, it's very good old Neon where he talks about how he would have killed himself and should I live stream it? And he talks about like, oh, if I kill myself, like, you know, I'll be like, I can either kill myself or I can do like a political assassination. Like, and the thing is, I'm hot, right? I'm aesthetic. And I can, I can always leak that I have a girlfriend so they don't make me think I'm an incel. And the thing is, I'll be so effective. I'll be like based accelerationist, right? I'll, I'll force the normies to give the based right wing young fascist young males power, right? But obviously, this is just fantasies I have while driving around the valleys, right? He says I would never like you know he he has the again the Straussian thing. He 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 no he normatively denies these fantasies or just says oh I'm just playing around. These are just ideas, but in reality, these are based in true beliefs. <clears throat> so. To, to accelerate, to take the left-handed path of acceleration, um, he basically says this. You know, he says, no, I'm not going to kill myself. Not tonight. Not yet. Should I go gamble more? Find a prostitute like Stephen Paddock and share his luxurious suite? Maybe gain my vitality back? Or maybe it's another creative project coming to focus. Maybe I should put my YouTube on a definite hiatus and write my next novel. But about what? For better or worse, I still got life ahead of me. And in italics. And then by the grace of God, I discovered a church of the final thought to be continued. And then we get into funky town, which for me is where the pedal really hits the metal. Um, you know, he, there's a picture of a, the hanging fool. And under, under, under it is a quote by Lips Inc., which is, gotta make a move to a town that's right for me. And it's funky town. He talks about this video called funky town the reason why it's called funky town it's a cartel video where a man who has his face basically completely peeled off and only has stumps for hands is basically being kept alive by a like an iv tube going into a stump of a god neck. i wish that were me and it's basically being <laughs> <laughs> and he's being tor slowly tortured slowly they want to make it last as long as possible while in the background sweet child of mine and fucking funky town are playing in the background and he and Matt recollects this. He watched this as a very young man in middle school, and he kept on fantasizing about it. He kept on seeing his faces of his teachers basically completely peeled off and their hands as stumps. And every time he would hear that song on the radio or something, either Funky Town or, or Child of Mine, it always those memories would keep on rushing back to him. And it's a it's a great 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 scene. And he talks about basically this legitimate violence, this real real deal holy field violence. Right, it's not the abstracted violence of above the border, much like Latin America. Because he says, you know, why do we focus on the Middle East rather than what's south of the border? Because south of the border, in a lot of ways, it's much more brutal and much more, dare I say, pagan and base and normative and on the nerves in terms of violence and real than what is happening in the Middle East. And uh, he talks about this and he realizes this. It's like uh, it stimulates the reason why we need this violence. He's, he's, he thinks it overall as a good thing. It, it stimulates what is human. It stimulates the, the like, on-the-nerve reality of humanity, both violence and extreme pornography. It, and yes, he'll expand in a Bapian way, is that the reason why it, it so visually affects you is because you're so numb to everything else. You need something that's, just, like, in its own way, filth and decay are the best weapons against, like, the normative, stale, geriatric structure of the normative society. So it's only by embracing the filth to a certain degree. It's almost like a like a pincer movement of both the filth and the orthodox morality can pincer move against the stiff, stifling nomos of the normative reality around you. And he he talks about this. It says such violent contact, like extreme pornography, stimulates us in a way that humans aren't necessarily supposed to be stimulated, showing us potential facets of the human experience that none that but the most degraded or unfortunate specimens would have considered just decades ago. 
and uh and this is what leads him to making his own archetypes of the World Wide Web. He makes a tarot deck basically. This is where you get the tarot deck, but instead of the tarot deck of the classical figures of the tarot, he replaces the cards of the tarot with deck with shock sites. With actual Yes, with sock sites, with Uncle Ted, with the kill dozer, with the Kim Kardashian sex tape. Um uh. I think I think the the faceless man of Funky Town, I think he is the fool. I think he replaces the fool with him. You know, with the most likely the I, I, I can't wait. serving I can't as a noose. wait for the for the for the six of cups to be tub girl. Oh <laughs> yeah. No no the six of cups being probably what the two girls one cup. That, remember, that, that would be the one of cups, this. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> this could be some good merch actually. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What, what are you gonna do with BBS, the party? Call me. <laughs> yeah. The king. Well, well, it, this also ties into one of the essays because he describes tarot deck is he describes tarot as fundamentally a cope, but at the end of the day, it's the tarot deck is a language, it's a vocabulary, it's a visual vocabulary from the past to deal with the present. Is these it's, archetypes it's high, are, highly charged semiotic language? Yeah. Yes, it's mimetic. It's it's a very very it's it's like bullets. It's like a deep deep themes and deep deep archetypes in bullet-sized cards basically lots of impact in them and um and it, it, it's an alchemical language it's a new frontier of human psychological stimulation and um uh, i hope they're real by the way i definitely will <laughs> be asking because he says dm if you he says literally uh dm if you want to have a look i would gladly play the tarot deck to destroy the world actually but um finally we get to the arc the finishing of arc two remember arc one was stan the pillar stan Right with Y and Z, and now we finally have Palm Springs for religious reasons, and basically you have uh, a it's a recounting of a bunch of yeast life people uh, going to Palm Springs for religious reasons. Everyone says they're going to Palm Springs for religious reasons. Some deeply autistic dude, a married couple, just randos basically, and they're later found to all be basically brutalized, decapitated, and amputated, and uh, in a cross shape in the desert, and. And the other side of the cavern uh, is Matthew Pegasus. Yes, the body of Matthew Pegasus is found. He's wearing a robe. He's 29 years old. He's a live streamer, an esoteric e-celeb. And he's holding in his hand a the Buddha blade. Based, oh, I, I call it the Buddha blade because Lord knows a kartika. It's a, a razor-sharp, he handled kartika resting in front of him. The knife had been cleaned, but in investigators suspected that it or one like it had been used on max and the others so this is the difference of enlightenment that uh matt goes through this is the two the internal change versus the extreme radical change that he talks about with his father or the topic he wants to discuss with his father uh it, this is him he basically he chops the yeast that around him in order to make the bread of his enlightenment, right? The yeast life surrounding him, the 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 my wholesome innocent people he kills as a, as a cult giga jet, and um, and you notice he also is a Buddha vista in, in this uh, scene as well, but un, unlike the Buddha vista with the green Ugh. apple, right? And he also dies differently too. The first of Buddha vista, the man sitting in a lotus he, symbol, he died of a heart attack. Lotus this time he died of exposure and he was dried. Yes, and, uh, but traditionally it's from starvation, yeah. uh, but he still had food in his stomach, right? Which is which is which perplexes the 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 cops. And it, you see the difference between two different ways of enlightenment. You have the internal enlightenment of the green apple, uh, seen with his, with his little position earlier, which is purely internal. Basically, there's no radical action; it's only internal reaction to the world around you. It's purely the green apple ending is the gnostic ending, versus the gigachad cult, um, cult pegasus. He is taking the actually the affirmative radical, imposing the will. He's taking the bap route. This is the bronze age mindset. Uh, Pegasus. He acts uh, through his work of violence, which he describes in his essay later on, which is the key to all of this fiction. He describes that amoral violence, basically much like Heraclitus saying war is the, is the ancestor of all people, the 
Acts of amoral violence is an explosion. Chaos is from a creation of the nomos. All nomos, all society, all traditions are birthed from chaos. Chaos is the seed. It is the things that fertilize. That's why we call conservatives, normally conservatives, cuckservatives, because they're fundamentally cuckolds. He talks about this in the essay. That the only way to truly have a tradition is to find a tradition. And only to find a tradition or foundation of tra a tradition is to impregnate it, basically, through the seed of chaos. So yep, this is the two the strange, curious deaths of Matt Pegasus. You got the Green Apple Matt Pegasus, who takes a the internal anarch or the Ernst Jünger route of the Forest Passage, where he internally escapes from the crippling, crippling de demiurge of society around him. He takes a he takes the internal route of escape, which is the Green Apple ending, versus the external explosion of a creating of a new order, creating of a new will, a new nomos, which is the Giga Chad cult pegasus which is revealed here and it's through and it's, it's this is where it gets a little crafty and it's basically modern lovecraft of course he has to sprinkle in some lovecraft because it, this is through the eyes of a university religious teacher university religious um scholar and uh he reveals that the this is connected to an old tibetan mantra like back in the 1960s or 1980s they tried to get these students to all repeat this ancient it's tibetan an mk mantra ultra project. project yeah it's it's like the russian experiment on like uh, on like the creepy the creepy pasta where the one chinese guy he ends up killing himself and he writes the mantra in his own blood and anyone who knew about the mantra and and it's proportional it's concentric circles the more you know tibetan and the more you know about the the buddhist belief the more likely you're going to want to kill yourself and others yeah the, it's, so it's it's it's, it's a mo more effective it's a it's a it's a cognito it's a information hazard yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's info hazard it's like it's like rocco's basilisk yeah and um uh, and so in uh, the best quote from this actually because it ties into the essay is uh he talks about how useless modern day esotericism is and this protagonist this religious scholar he feels like uh the painting of the alchemist from uh 1663 which is the first picture is is it prefaces the whole book is this picture of an alchemist this urban alchemist surrounded by cluttered basically he's like a hoarder of alchemist gear and it's basically this because by the 16 mid 1660s uh, alchemy was already considered a joke basically and so you have these all these esoteric theory cells cluttered in with these alchemy equipment and it's so it's a it's a figure of comedy much like how don quixote was by the time of 1616s and he realizes that th this this death this brutal this brutal he he compares it to a saturn cult that he he believes that this is like a cult of saturn trying to regain the rebirth of saturn the rebirth of a new esoteric order it is a way of bringing back the, the internal saturn ways and he compares this to Kabbalah, actually. And he uh, says, and I quote, I imagine the voices of the keeper of the light to the initiate. I'm not talking about Judaic Kabbalah anymore, mind you. Something more speculative. Quote, we can give you all the ingredients to practice the great art and the great alchemy of ethnogenesis or the founding of a people, a tradition, a religion. We can give you these things and all the power, cachet, and legacy that comes with it. But should you fall through an initiatory process, you will be killed. Of course, there's the to be continued. And um, of course, it's not to be continued in the fiction per se, but it's continued to be in the essays. And finally, the fiction ends with um, with the return of the Stan arc. And uh, it is revealed on September 9th, I believe. It's, it's, it's September 6th, sorry. Which is the very day, by the way, that Bat Pegasus dies, by the way. It's September 6th. All right. And uh, now before we finish off with the Stan arc, I would like to hear from... Matt Pegasus' biggest hater, Cap. Cap, what? why do you think this beautiful tale... <laughs> why do you think this beautiful tale of the left hand and negative hand of nihilism, this beautiful will as life and will as existence, is cringe and gay? What? <laughs> okay, I object to the frame <laughs> of the question. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I, the things that I enjoy about it are essentially, like... I, I do I do like showing the the sort of s the seduction of the left hand path there um, and the sort of self um, uh, self extinction uh, being embraced in in one hand and a, a sort of 
what I, I guess you would interpret as a, a, a lesser form of the, of the Bodhisattva path uh, at the beginning. Like it's, it is an interesting take. I would have liked to see it explicated more and told in less of an oblique way, maybe. Um, or, you know, like I, like I said before with, with a structural modification, I think things would have been clearer, um, as things went on. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, I am not a stranger to esoterica. Like I, I do, I, I collect, I collect theosophical texts. It's, uh, it's not, it is not, uh, like alien to me to try to conceptualize things in these ways. Um, but one of the things about esoterica in general is that, um, you know, especially if you're bringing in things like, uh, like latter day esoterica, you know, especially say Crowleyists or, uh, you know, even, even golden dawn stuff like slightly before Crowley, um, you know, all of it basically since then has been highly syncretic. So the interpretations tend to be, <clears throat> um, or rather the understandings tend to be as various as the people who have, who hold the understandings. So when you're trying to learn someone's perspective on esoterica, it helps to, um, sort of, if you're going to have a, a narrative sort of have their theory, uh, in there in a more explicated way, in my opinion, the, uh, um, yeah. And I mean, I, we're going to get to the essays and we'll get a, a slightly different angle on all of this. Um, but I, yeah, I, uh, I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was interesting. I would have liked to have seen a, l a little more done with it basically. Mm -hmm. Like I can hear the Baltic bucks jingling your pocket <laughs> as you type this, Alt as you say oh this. Oh my I God. Yes. Come yes, here, Theo. Clearly a jealous stample. <laughs> Six pieces of uh, a Patreon I'm, gold. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Call it. Yeah, I'll go. I'm gonna go find a a shady grove and hang out in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I actually I broadly agree with that. Oh, good. Yeah. No, no. I just I broadly agree. I I I thought again. I thought it was pretty well written. It was just um, I kind of wanted it stretched out more and over longer. And I, I agree with your with your overall analysis of it though, uh, Gabe. In terms, I am not into this esoterica stuff at all. So I'm sure there's stuff that I'm just missing as well. But um, but um, no. But I, I think your reading is right. There's sort of the more destructive path versus the what would you call? It? I guess vitalistic leaning path. No, which... the, the 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 giga cultist is the vitalist. Well, yes. the 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 green apple. Him just pleasantly holding an apple and uh, dying of a self-imposed heart attack is more of an internal revolution rather than an mm -hmm. external vitalist explosion revolution yeah and uh and if as a treat as a treat i would just like to add there's another metaphor in here uh, totally which is obviously he compares himself to two writers if y'all remember two particular writers you have the gloomy fate of normie uh, Pegasus, who he compares to Michelle Welbeck, but who else does he compare himself to, by the way, in that scene with a Glock? He compares remember. himself to Yukio Mishima, and you compare his death. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the Giga, where he Giga Chiley killed those people as a cultist. Mm -hmm. He, that's the Western version of what Mishima did. Right of the Mishima of Sun and Steel. Well, right, he's kind of a, he's he's adopting Eastern religiousism, but yeah, but, but I understand your meaning. Yeah, he is right. But remember, way, the way Mishima did his suicide is fundamentally Western flavored because he was a Asian version of a weeb. If you remember, we all remember that beautiful depiction. He committed of Mishima seppuku. as Saint Sebastian. Yeah, yeah he committed for seppuku. Japanese revolution against the Imperial American whatever. <laughs> Yes, but it's a it's reactionary. It's a, it's romantic reactionaryism, which is flavored with a Western sentiment. Oh, by the way, he's he's uh, Mishima. 
he views himself, he views his own culture from a romantic, I don't want to say, dare I say, orientalist, but he views it as a way of a vitalist romanticism. It is Hellenic. The way he does this is I don't downright know where Hellenic. He this stuff. <laughs> I'm, Bro, he committed sep- He's a Japanese nationalist who committed seppuku, and you're saying he, he, he did it, he committed seppuku doing it for the West. in an American way. <laughs> Yes, because it's it was a it was seppuku as performance. It was a public display. He gives a it's big a populist display. rant. Well, yeah, but no, but he he gives a public rant. And the thing is, mm-hmm. if you notice, there's more Western Japanese uh, Mishima fans than there are Eastern Japanese fans. Reason why? Because there is a fundamentally Hellenic spirit to the way Citation. he offers himself. Citation he constantly <laughs> his 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 self depiction as Saint Sebastian. Multiple viewing of himself being killed in a Western way, the, the rapier uh, self-portrait, the Saint Sebastian self-portrait, the way he gave a public speech. Like the thing is, him re- relying on this very romantic, public, him dressing up. Speaking, it, it's a LARP. Western confirmed. A Western <laughs> like, he was an international Before star that, everyone only, only talked in private. <laughs> yeah, but you you know what I'm trying Before to say. Before Douglas MacArthur him- changed the Japanese culture. <laughs> Everyone spoke yes. in private. It was a very private <laughs> culture. No one had ever stood in yes. front of a crowd and said words before. If they had well, had no, public but... speaking technology, they might have won the war. No wonder they're so angry at White Pigu, making all that noise. Yeah. Yes, the, the narrow-eyed Oriental had to see the Faustian wide oh, eye yes. of the of the of the white. The dog-eyed shogun. Right, yeah. <laughs> Yes, the, the narrow focus that see their physiognomy reflects their spiritual Spenglerian spirit. The narrowed eye of the Oriental versus the Faustian eye of it's it's as wide as the Faustian man needs it. Yeah, right? he was. He was yeah, eyelids. he was definitely the first Japanese guy to stand on a podium and talk to a crowd, and everyone had to everyone got a crick in their neck because they don't have the upwards uh, peripheral vision due to their epicanthic folds. See, the Western man <laughs> yes. is uniquely adapted to look at a guy standing on a podium. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, the, but the thing Human is, it's fun relying confirmed. on that. <laughs> Listen, we need Steve Saylor to confirm this, but uh, but no, but the reason why it, it it's it's reactionary, which is a new fundamental form. It's the reason why he's LARPing is romantic. He's basically Don Quixote. He's a noticeable Don Quixote. You realize most even the monarch, even the emperor, didn't care about him. He was more reactionary than the actual emperor of fucking Japan. Right, he was living out this narrative, this fictionalization of Japanese history. He was living his art. And I this mean, is a, reactionaryism so can... long predates that, though. I mean, there were reactionary figures in J- Japan, even or any other country. Yeah, like <laughs> like going back to the um, Tokugawa shogunate. Like there was a obviously there was a huge reaction. I don't remember the exact name of like the revolt or whatever, but the, I I just find this framing a little a little. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't it doesn't quite make sense. And the and the Matt Pegasus arc, where he's ending, he's in a Eastern mysticism pose with Buddhism, and he has a mystic blade. Um, so I see it. I don't know. I guess I see it different. I just don't see. This is like we're getting far off, far afield. But, but I don't it's, see the, it's, it's the art. Yeah, let's let's, the, let's just talk about afterlife. Japanese history. <laughs> let's. Honestly, yeah, let's do it. Let's weep out, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like because he is a weeb. It's artist. It's art as afterlife. That's mm-hmm. what it's all about. Mishima's art was, was entirely involving his afterlife. His greatest performance was his own decay of the angel, right? And much like Matt, anime so, eschatology. Mish- <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, Mishima kills himself in a very deeply tinged Western way, versus way Pegasus does it. Which he does it in an extremely Eastern viewing way but internally it's very it's built within western alchemy it's built within western esotericism it's exoterically asian but it is esoterically western how is it western right? though it, it's also the, the alchemy the alchemy if anything is is more of an internal alchemical process like based on yes that's the western no alchemy. it's the, no it, western alchemy is typically not internal alchemy internal alchemy is highly highly asiatic Western alchemy yeah. is 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 like external alchemy. And chemistry, yeah. Right? It's like yeah, the precursor to chemistry in some ways. Yeah, the the um, the union of opposites and things like that. Um, 
heavily derived from Eastern sources, even even when used in the West. And, and the the Western original originated alchemy alchemical sources are are external. Well, I think I think the death is mostly because remember. He, it, I think it's the Schopenhauerian aspect, right? Schopenhauer, how Schopenhauer uh, took the Eastern elements and he, using the Western creativity of re recontextualizing this new information, he donned it. He, he is in it's an Oriental performance, right? He takes these Western elements and he embodies the mantra, but he does it in a fundamentally Western environment, which is the desert, right? The desert is uniquely American. Right, he uh, doesn't. They don't have he deserts elsewhere. In Asia, yeah. yeah they don't I think that's where those boot Tibetan monks come from. Pre-dry mountains and, and <laughs> there's snow on the Tibetan mountains. So yeah, about? not Tibet. Whatever the Gobi Desert. Yeah, there's deserts everywhere. But yeah, but it's in, in turn with the the American frontier. Man, but basically, mm. he's, he's a California native. What I'm talking about is you can. I, I thought it was actually pretty obvious. You can clearly see these. You can compare and contrast the way Mishima killed himself versus the way this version of Pegasus killed himself. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to contrast for sure. It's, if it's wrong, I, I think at least I'm creatively. Wrong. I I I, something I, to chew I, on. I I think that everything you said is bullshit, but I believe it because it's entertaining <laughs> yeah. to do so. <laughs> Yeah, it's Elon's law. The most entertaining reality is, is the, the true one. True. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we finally got the fiction done with. Now we can get to the shower grind set of the essays, which is the <laughs> B side of this album. And it's just yeah, it's a, it's a really essay heavy uh, from here on out, which I did not expect. I don't know if there was some forewarning of that, but I was just like, okay, now we're buckling in. And well, maybe it's the album part of the black album because albums have a sides and B sides. Well, yes, I understand that. Um, but yeah, it's just like straight essays. I guess I, the essays, I, I enjoyed some of them quite a lot. Some of them, I guess I struggle with how old they are. And maybe part of the concept behind that is you're going through his own transformation and, and, um, and life. And then it ends with the, the, it, the, the the dragon day that is it's the i guess it was cut but wasn't it the conclusion of dragon day well it's it's not yeah it's like oh, an addendum, addendum. it's yeah. it's sort of like the you know the the author the author explains himself um yeah it, it's a, a being a fairly lengthy author statement i mean dragon day i think was like 150 pages or something and and that was a, a good 20 something like that um um yeah so i mean you've already you've already sort of referred to a lot of the concepts that are discussed in um that are discussed in the essay section in the sort of uh affirmational versus uh negational uh approaches right so you can go with the with the affirmational vitalism or you can go with the schopenhauerian Thomas Ligotti and uh, dissolution, right? Um, right. And you you can kind of see looking at looking at these these essays where um where Pegas had developed his his train of thought and and what and how the these various authors sort of connected to each other and there uh, mm-hmm. you know he extensively references you know five or six authors, right? Um, in uh, in the section that that has informed the be- the black album. Um, yeah, uh, it is the recitation of. Let's see. This is this is basically the this essay is actually the central piece of basically the entire of the entire piece. It is the Renaissance of the witch rule. Yeah, I mean, and he does go into he does go into chaos magic, uh, which he which he. This is the one about the book, right? Hmm? That's the one about. That's the one about the book, the one hundred and one esotericism, one hundred and one book. Oh, ba- uh, Babby's, no, Renaissance Babby's of the first Ritual chaos picture- magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, uh, this is the Renaissance of the witch rule. He talks about like reintroducing the idea of a ritualization and how violence 
amoral violence is the creation of all nomos, basically, or creation of all traditions. And basically he's trying to create a new mysticism or a new esotericism as basically another way to fight against the hegemony as a new way, an internal mysticism, an internal religion, in order to fight against the normative religion around you. I I do. Um, he does have a, he does have a section in um, in the essay. It may be this one, or it may be the the Alex Kazemi one, where he mentions that in doing his the, the chaos magic rituals, which which for those who don't know is. Um, uh, it's it's essentially a, a lot of the way a lot of chaos magic is presented is essentially uh, the secret it's a it's a manifesting style thing where you will connect uh, a desired outcome or an object or something you want to reinforce in your life um to a, a, a somatic action um and typically also some sort of mental component um, so you create a ritual, as, as he says, um, you create a ritual and then you execute it and you consistently execute it. Um, and he mentions how, how that had somewhat, um, perversely sort of led him back into a, uh, into a practice of prayer what would be clo more cl more closely a, a conventional form of prayer. And he does relate, you know, his practice is, is lighting candles. Um, mm -hmm. And he relates how that, you know, is something that would not be unfamiliar to, you know, Catholics or, or Orthodox to, to light candles in prayer um, or for the veneration of the saints, for example. Um, and I mean, I thought that was, I thought that was, I mean, it was a, it was a confessional piece, right? Um, not, you know, not capital C confessional, but, uh, I, I thought that it was, I thought that it was interestingly, uh, Frank in, in regards to his own, in his, in regards to his own beliefs, you know, um, less conclusive than I thought it would be as well. Cause it kind of ends with like, you know, this is basically what I'm trying. He's like, I, I, <laughs> exactly I'm, just, I'm just figuring it, it out. I think you guys this. ought to give it a try too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Light some candles now and again. Um, I mean, I, I am a, uh, I'm a big believer in ritual. I think one of the, the worst consequences of liberalism is, uh, the diminution of ritual people saying things like, ah, well, why would you have a wedding? It's just a piece of paper. I'm just going to go to the courthouse rather than saying vows in front of everyone I care about. <laughs> like as mm -hmm. if, as if one of these things, as if these things are in some way equivalent. Right. Um, j just as an example. Uh, but uh, yeah, ritual rich. I think ritual is, is tremendously important. And while I would not uh, ever count myself a chaos magician, um, and I, I would, you know, doubt the efficacy of them, not in a, not in a fedora tipping way, but, uh, I am a Catholic, so, <laughs> uh, you, you're not a real dark elf. I'm sorry. You are officially banned. From the dark uh, elf I'm, I'm banned from the dark elf board. Um, uh, yeah, rich rituals are, are tremendously important and they're, they're, they're caught. They have distinct cognitive effects even if they, you know, don't have uh, metaphysical effects that, that might be ascribed to them. So. Mm -hmm. It gave me strong uh, flashbacks to the essay I referenced like once a month, A Living Religion by friend of the show, Michael Lindsay. Um, and some of his concepts about your ability to connect with um, spirituality. And also there, uh, Pegasus talks about the... Uh, you know, this commonality, how there's a sort of this, uh, a lot of these, these practices form the base layer of all other spiritualities. And so there's some kind of like precursor religion. So anyway, anyone that reads this finds that, that interesting, I would recommend that particular essay on Substack. It's soon to be a book as well, actually, which hopefully we'll cover. Um, but yeah, I actually found this essay more, yeah, as a confessional, I, I actually, I, I quite enjoyed it. And, um, 
I related to a lot more than I than I went in expecting with with a title like the you know the the Black Album. I really thought we we're gonna go in and it's just gonna be um, all these you know I, I don't know high high and mighty like oh I I can move things with my mind or kind of crazy <laughs> more crazy shit. It was way more down to earth and enjoyable. Okay, you want it just 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 because just because I wanna I wanna give a deep cut here. Anyone who does want to read a I can move shit with my mind absolutely fucking unhinged uh, <laughs> esoteric book. You have my interest. Read yeah. Cyclomancy. Read fucking Cyclomancy. Mm-hmm. I found I found <laughs> Cyclomancy uh, in a uh, it's by by Frank Young. I found Cyclomancy in a very dusty attic uh, of a of a used bookstore that was in a in a. Uh, an old house they had a bunch of esoterica the best and and rarest thing they had was cyclomancy picked that guy up it is absolutely bonkers it will tell you how to (laughs) mind control people for the purposes of uh struggle cuddles and mind control you say and Mm. yes and it's like oh yes you, you can use this for evil and you should so Cyclomancy, pick that up. I think it might. I think it might also be on Google Books. the The physical books are uh, unobtainium, but uh, I think I think you can find uh, digital copies very easily. Sorry, that you, sounds you it awesome. Yeah, this might this might be note we're covering next. Now, actually, oh, God. <laughs> if yeah, if, if, uh, if we do a uh, if we do another ju- Justin Moan level thing, we could do a Frank Young retrospective. That guy was a fucking psycho. But. It, it, during Halloween month, uh, during a frightful October, October we'll, yeah, we'll, we, we, yeah, we will we'll, we'll, for the Halloween special. We will we'll do we'll do something like that. Um, but actually, what I really liked about the ritual essay was he resurrected Mike Maul's gothic violence, which I think we all agree was kind of a failure. Like we were all we were hyped up after because in a lot of ways, Mike Maul's harassment architecture kind of got the ball rolling in dissident fiction in a lot of ways. I mean, aesthetically, it influenced Adam's mixtape Arborea, especially with the cover. It influenced Adam in general, Mike Maul's style and aesthetic and mystique. Yeah. Um, it also influenced, all, as well, clearly, um, also influenced, admittedly, um, Matt. I mean, yeah, the oblique, and, uh, the oblique storytelling here um, was was definitely... Um, I mean, it was it was... The the black album is better than Gothic Violence. It's for sure better than Gothic Violence. Uh, I think it, it it perfects what Gothic Violence wanted it to do. I Mike Maul tried to do that. a sincere. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Oh. It's 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 a it's oh. a big it's a big improvement uh, on the on that experimental style. Um, I mean, we should cover Gothic Violence. I don't think people gave it enough. No interest. Oh, in it's doing just Wow! Wow! The founding father, of dissonant lit. Do you want to give him give him his, his harassment due? architecture? Is is an extremely entertaining read. Goth- gothic violence is not good. Like, well, I mean, even even Matt admits this, but he he. he I I actually love this. I I love references in my essays. I kind of love comparing and contrasting and chewing on these six different authors: Dugan, Bap, Bugatti. Mike Maul, uh, technically Lovecraft, and uh, were so you, you have opening all in- every link as you went, Gabe? Were you just like pop, opened, popping links? Yes, uh, fucking him and Robert Stark hanging out in the mall, and some like Danny DeVito looking dude. He's like, hey, listen, back in my day, this this place was popping off. Yes, I absolutely did go link hunting. I'm a Wallace <laughs> fan, of course. My favorite parts are the end notes. All right, thank you very much. Nice. Oh, I will say, yeah, the. So th- there are a lot of end notes in here, um, and they are uh, put in as un- untruncated uh, links sometimes to things like Amazon or, or or what have you. So you have like a half a page of like you know just just nonsense redirects. Um, what should be industry standard? is um, the QR links with shortened descriptions that were used by Passage Press when they published Unqualified Reservations, Volume 1, 
for yeah, Curtis Yeah, is that a passage exclusive? Is that a passage innovation? Because I don't think I've I ever have saw never anyone else seen, other I have than not passage. seen it since, but it is what they used. It is mm. easily the most useful, uh, and it is especially if you're going to try to you know do do hyperlinks rather than just a, a page reference, right? Um, it is it is by far the the best way to do that. It's a it's a huge huge bump in quality. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know, obvious. Just this is just going forward. <laughs> Please adopt this as best practices. It's it's mm-hmm. it is um, an amazing upgrade. So, oh, but it, it doesn't that's not, that's that, not that, and like, this is not a dig on this is not a dig on Matt at all. I'm just saying that it would have it would have been a, a bonus for the book. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like a lesson learned. Uh, for, I think for all of us because I had not seen it before that either. Yes, uh, exactly. But then again, that's why it costs fifty dollars for a for a paperback from them. Though maybe that's maybe that's why. Matt's trying to protect our wallets. I'm pretty sure. I thought it was like a, it was like a forty dollar hardcover. Oh, is the hardcover? Yeah, oh, it was okay. like a forty dollar hardcover. Yeah, we're talking. We're, yeah, it's it for the mold book one was fair. It was we were pretty fair. Yeah, you know, hopefully, hopefully, like they did with Steve Sailor, they're selling hats now for Sailor. I hope we get the Dark Elf jacket. You know, mold book's mm. famous like letter jacket. For Volume Two, we gotta get a Dark Elf jacket. You gotta get a. You gotta get a wig. With Moldbug's haircut and some <laughs> black elf ears, <laughs> Italian porn star blown out hair. Yeah. yeah, maybe a little, maybe a little, uh, a little ampule of brown face and like a red dot for your forehead, so you can do both the the Brahmin and the and the dark elf at the <laughs> same time. <laughs> <laughs> the dark Brambani. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, I am Team Hobbit. I just want to grill. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I am a dark elf elitist. Thank you very much. I I, I want to be at all the cool parties. It's just because you're. I, it's I just because you're brown, Gabe. <laughs> Listen, I am the only authentic European import in this podcast. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. Say yeah, Bodhisattva. Uh, listen my my ancestors bloody 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 curse upon you and your north african heritage all right you should go back to fucking eritrea you should say uh you should say matt's last name uh without turning him into a horse with wings (laughs) well listen we've all been turning him into horses Uh, i I have not (laughs) that's part of his esoteric uh transformation Yes, the alchemy. Pegasus. It's, it's, yeah. the, the the earth versus the ethereal sky of the bird, right? The Pegasus, right? It's an alchemy. It's inherently alchemical. Honestly, theme. just it, honestly the, leaning into it, like use the old mobile oil uh, Pegasus logo or something like that. It could be. It could be pretty Kino, to be to be real. But. Yeah, you should lean into it. Um. Anyway, back on track. Any, any for the essays. Let's 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 cap it off. Capping it back in. Any, any other thoughts? I guess on these uh, this essay series. Anything that's like I can't miss it. Uh, I think you guys want to mention. Um. So yeah. I mean, we can we can rapid fire it. So he does have um his uh, uh his sort of like uh, Gonzo report on his layover in Vegas, which is you know he had reworked some of it into his into his fiction. So he 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 included both the original and the fictionalized one, um, uh, which I I found I found interesting, uh, but it did provide some some sort of insight into the into his writing process. So you know it, to what degree he had, uh, you know, what hyper fictionalized this already somewhat fictionalized uh, accounting of his of his trip uh and uh then he had also then he also included um the postscript to dragon day and dragon day is and i'm 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 putting the ball on the tee here for gabe uh even though gabe has probably said 80 percent of the words in this particular episode (laughs) um he he talks about the 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 legacy of Strauss 
Oh God! And the influence. Why you bring I, it up? I, I, and the I and coomed so hard. I coomed the so hard. Yeah. <laughs> well, and his, and the degree to which his experiences at uh, Cornell influenced his his writing of, um, Dragon influenced Day. his writing of Dragon Day. Yeah, and you know there was there was one part of that that I found really, really interesting in a in a West has fallen sort of way. <laughs> Um, where a uh, the basis of the yellow house in Dragon Day, and in in Dragon Day there is um, there's this uh, very elite service fraternity called the Yellow House, um, where it, it's it's coed. Everyone who lives there is a high achiever, um, and they're also uh, paused to all hell. So they're super leftist, total total activists. Will you know have never found a, a picket sign they wouldn't hold. Um, and that was based on a um, on a place in at Cornell, which is called uh, the Telluride House, and it included, um, and I mean it it included a lot of founding sort of neocon people it was it was uh it was very influential back in the day but by the time he was there had had really uh uh really decayed extremely ju- uh, red red square friendly very red yeah. square friendly yeah. set of people coming from that in the past and that he had this sort of obsession with them that he speaks of and he kind of wonders if it's he has this relationship with power or maybe like an unhealthy relationship with power or mental preoccupation with like the people that, that claim power and then his own, um, what was the term? I mentioned it earlier. Um, establishmentarian, like natural disposition to establishmentarianism. Yeah. Because he was a, um, he had, he was reflecting on the, on 2016 leading up to the election where he mm-hmm. was, where the idea of, I, I think the exact quote was, being a conservative for Hillary did not seem um, unreasonable to him at the time, because he was a neocon. And to be fair, if you're a neocon, you should have, you know, versus tr- Trump versus Hillary, you should support Hillary. You know, just yeah. If if the if that is your, if those are your priorities, because she was a neocon, but um, mm-hmm. the, uh, but after. After Trump's victory, I mean, I guess he he was he was a late red pill. <laughs> Let's just say. Well, he was he's he's a young guy, so you know he gets a pass. It is mind blowing to think about. I couldn't imagine pulling for Hillary and then being like, "All right, let's look at on with Dan Baltic. Let's see what this guy has to <laughs> say." <laughs> what, what a shift! Um, but it just show it goes to show that this uh, this kind of this kind of milieu really does draw all sorts. It's a big tent. It's a big tent when yeah. you're uh, standing outside in the rain. It's the biggest tent there is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. Yeah, well, he, he talks about that in actually briefly in the fictional section about hanging out with the old, like a skinhead wig nets of the pre, he calls it the Tower of Babel, right? Charlottesville, which is a great comparison, by the way. It might as well have been the Tower of Babel with the, or the scurrying of the Shire in a lot of ways for us. Um, and, uh, I, I definitely do agree with that, and I think it's honestly the Straussian thing is very charming. I thought I found it very charming actually in a lot of ways. And uh, despite I think it's him. I mean, I mm-hmm. do agree with Dave to a certain degree. It's there's a tinge of moral faggotry to it, where like you know it's like oh it, it's he's trying to not say you can't end in total destruction, right? And Strauss is trying to defend philosophy from the city because he cites multiple times Rousseau, Nietzsche, and. Uh, Glorcon, I forget the name of, of uh, Plato's brother, or, or Glocon, or something like that, also saying the city is horrible, right? But Strauss mm-hmm. is talking about, he's saying the, the these dissonant writers, these vilest young men, are much like the German nihilists, who prefigure the reaction against communism. But they did not negate the uh, communism's main conceit, which is that the modern civilization must be destroyed, the status quo must be destroyed. The Ernst Jünger, Spengler, Carl Schmitt all agreed that the, the the anomian neoliberalism of the Weimar must end and the normative must be vanquished and destroyed. 
and uh, and Strauss said that was the ultimate failure because the reactionaries were still playing within the frame of the revolutionary or the frame of the restorer of the nomos. You know, I guess, for example, even our good friend Adolf Hitler, he was anti monarch <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right? Friend of the show. <laughs> right, sorry. Friend of the show. Friend of the pod. Good friend, good friend of the show. <laughs> Feather Richard Wagner fan. You know, I, I listened to me and him. He, he, he introduced me to Richard Wagner. You know, he gives me all the details. It's like, you know, it's like listening to Adam talk about like Tom Petty. You know, it's just a wonderful history of this great, great uh, musician. But yeah, so it was a very interesting piece of him comparing it to himself, because he basically wants to say, you know, there's a great, there's a danger to flirting with these ideas. It is a danger to flirting with absolute destruction, the complete burning down of the city, right? But he doesn't outright, yet again, this whole thing is Straussian, I mean, the very end of the list, he references uh, uh, writing and political prosecution, Strauss's famous book about, well, the whole hidden message thing, is both the very last book referenced in reading list and the very last note in the end notes is both Strauss's book on hidden meetings and hidden texts and reading between the lines. So I do find it very, let's say, interesting that this essay does not outright uh, condemn uh, burning it all down, basically. Mm-hmm. And of course, in the very last words of the whole piece itself is literally the darkness inside me recognizes the darkness inside you. And which is, yeah. I, I think, a, a very beautifully Nietzschean inversion of uh, Nietzsche's idea of the egoism of the stars, how the noble aristocrat, the true noble highborn, reckon, when, he, when he recognizes beauty amongst an other noble, he, he praises it himself. Right, he, he, everything that is good and noble and righteous is a reflection of his own internal egoism. So I, I think that the darkness aspect is a beautiful inversion of that Nietzschean idea, actually. Or I guess I could say an alchemical inversion of uh, that idea. Eastern or Western alchemical, though? Obviously Western. I, I, it is a good tie-in, actually, to the... Um, and the, in, from the fiction side, A side... You know, the sort of Tibetan, there's sort of that, I guess it's a, an allegory, allegory of the same, towards the same concept of um, the, the, the dangers of the death. Knowing too much. We all know too much, perhaps. Um, all righty. Anything else, guys, on the B, 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 b side? Well, I did have one note. Um, it's actually on the, the frontis piece. Uh, so... On the front of this book, uh, to the upper right of the uh, of the Chaos Star and the Star of David, he has um, he has the numbers nine six nine, and I'm like ninety nine percent certain that that is some sort of uh, gematria, but I can't figure out what exactly it stands for. What the fuck is a gematria? Gematria is is Kabbalic numerology. Uh, if uh, any 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 uh, any true uh, enjoyer of Nick Land will note that many of his many of his recent uh, uh, postings have been have been in relation to gematria. The Black Album kind of famously um, it has a gematria of six six six. Right. That's that's mm. why it got. That's why it was used. It was a. It was a genius. The gematria, like the the gematria of the Black Album, when it was, you know, used by musicians, it was a, a coup. Right. Uh, uh, um, but I'm not sure what nine six nine, uh, means. I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I can't figure out what the, what the derivation is. Unfortunately, and I'm sure that I'm sure Matt has a has a good and very interesting explanation for that and I hope that he will tell us. Uh wait oh wait, so the black album isn't a reference to Weezer? Uh Weezer had a the black album? Yeah, two thousand eight. Beverly Hills, that's where I want to be. Oh they had black album. Interesting. Yeah, no, I mean I, I always uh I, I I guess my go to uh is um, Metallica. Yeah, I thought that as well. I guess we failed the the true millennial test. Didn't really recognize Weezer. Weezer, Chad, stay winning. 
I mean, I don't know. There's probably is there is there a better is there a better song than than Enter the Sand than Enter Sandman on on Weezer's Black Album? <laughs> well, okay, no, but every song on Pinkerton is absolutely better. <laughs> What's the gematria of Pinkerton? And anyway, anyway, so so but another obvious reference to Black Album uh, that Matt Pegas. Pegas, notice I said Pegas correctly this time. Good job. Um, You're growing. Lame. I have become the proud papa. <laughs> I'm sticking <laughs> this, with it. I have become white as the album he is referencing. Because have either of y'all read Joan Didion's to White album? No. I have not. Because apparently that, that's a big reference as well, Joan Didion's White album, which also is the inspiration for Brett Easton Ellis' White album, which is also a collection of both fiction or oh, essays. So it's both. So this novel is yet again. It's a mixture of his yearning for like a hipster, his hipster aesthetic, and also his esoteric. Right, the Jane, the um, Joan Didion uh, reference of the black, of the White Album versus the esoteric inner world of the esoteric Black Album. And uh, there, I, I do have a lot more to say. I, I have so much more to say about the essays, but I will probably do that in a later date. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a good summary. I guess just you know, just in recap though. Yeah, obviously the product of a lot of uh, a labor of love, and I I feel bad because yeah, it's just not it's the most not my genre, not my taste thing of anything we've done so far, thematically and in terms of what it's doing. But um, overall, I still enjoyed it. I I, I feel like I didn't say much about it, uh, so hopefully it doesn't come across as me feeling negatively about it. Um, I think I probably just got less from it than you guys did, just not being as into this stuff. No, no, I would just say, you know, I the I just would stand by sort of the structural uh, critiques I mentioned earlier, but while standing by the um, my, my compliments towards the overall the line by line uh, writing quality of it, and uh, yeah, I guess if you know anyone listening this far, if you haven't already read it, uh, maybe maybe check out the sample. Otherwise, but yeah, how about you guys? Any other? I guess, other closing high levels for anyone that made it through? Um, I would say that in terms of uh, quality of the fiction, I prefer Dragon Day. I thought he accomplished some really cool things with Dragon Day. Um, I think it, I think it is unfairly slept on. It is deeply unsettling and very unpleasant to read. Uh, but uh, it is that's because of its quality and because of the way that it succeeds at its at its goals um not because you know a good book ought to be fun um but uh you know this is this is pretty experimental um i think it's i think the project is it's a little it is a little half baked uh i like the insight i got into uh pegas as an author from it um and i hope that you know, I hope his I hope his next effort is another um, uh, piece of full length fiction, uh, because I think that his I think that if he is a a little I think if he was a little more grounded in the nuts and bolts of the narrative, he could work in some of his esoteric thematic elements in a more effective way, um, because he obviously has a lot to say and wants to layer things in but i think that if you weren't also telling a story obliquely that it might that it might all come together a little better and he's definitely capable of telling a more upfront story so because i assume in that case the, the, the non-oblique essay like the mall piece which is a separate from the because you said you like the straussian piece as well which is a basically a purely addendum to dragon day Right, so it's it's separate. I mean, I liked it because of the I liked it because of the author insight. Uh, that, like I, I found it, I found it interesting because I had read Dragon Day. If I hadn't read Dragon Day, I, th- I would have gotten fairly little out of it, other than there's this there's this uh, this place at uh, at Cornell that decayed rather <laughs> dramatically. I haven't even read Dragon Day, and I I did still enjoy that part actually. But but there was there is something to to that like in terms of just the composition with these older essays mixed in um, and all these it's this, these really really niche within niche within niche um, references to podcasts and and writers that it is um, 
I don't know. I don't know. It is like so fo- focused on a time and a place and a person in a place. Like if you never listened to one of his podcasts, New Right or something, or Strange Flows, like, and you pick this up, you'd be like, you know, you'd be so confused. Um, and granted, anyone that's going to read this will probably will come across it through those channels or, you know, a, a sort of related, semi-connected part of the, the, the broader scene. But I do wonder, yeah, how limiting that is in terms of people's ability to engage with it and maybe dating it. I, I do I do foresee this book because um, I, I, I hope that and I, I expect that uh, Matt will will write more in the future. I expect this book is going to become a deep cut. Mm-hmm. So, Agreed. It will become a hidden gem, a, a hidden esoteric mm-hmm. gem. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true. True uh, mystic Ah, the, the goal of every author. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to create an obscure work that's hard to find. Within an obscure micro-niche e-celeb community. You did it, Matt. Congratulations. Fantastic. I probably, honestly, I adored it, honestly. Uh, for me, this the, the way... I enjoy the esoteric. I love trying to dig in and like deeply, deeply trying to close read it my way throughout. And it was a definitely, for me, I thought it was an achievement. As soon as I hit the fiction essays and I read on the uh, ritualization of tradition or the or the reemergence of tradition, uh, of, of ritual, sorry, and then uh, about the ideas of foundationalism and everything, I just felt uh, I was just such an, in the same mental wavelength as Pegasus at that point because I, I kind of really, really as I slowly everything passed Funky Town. Funky Town is where I really, really started just kind of digging in and chewing and chewing and chewing and finally, and finally really just scraping every single detail I could. I was being as close reading as, as, as I possibly could. And to read that essay, right, which is the skeleton tea of the entire piece, really was extremely rewarding. I was deeply, deeply rewarded for my, you know, hound dog uh, approach to reading. So for me, as an esoteric, uh, you know, as a, as a resident Straussian, I was very, very, very much pleased to find the Black Album was as esoteric as its author. And uh, I definitely, I respect y'all's criticisms. I respect Cap's criticisms. And I think it definitely would have been a more focused piece and a much more clear piece if he kind of opened with the essays or opened or he didn't play his cards to his chest the way he did in terms of actually the theme and the mood. If, let's say, he kind of was openly discussing the themes of it rather than having it for you forced a reader to dig. But as, as, a, as a digger myself, um, I, I, pr- I proudly, proudly, proudly enjoyed my, my diggery in this piece. There you have it. <laughs> that's, that's the Blacked Album by Matt Pegasus. Yeah, thanks guys, and we'll wrap it there. Have a good night. Anyone who was For example, even our good friend Adolf Hitler, he was anti-monarch, right?